peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Gospel lessons from these last two weeks have been more uncomfortable than comfortable, and today is no exception. In the Gospel lesson for this morning, Jesus, who we welcomed six months ago at Christmas as our very own Prince of Peace, is now the Prince bearing the Sword of Truth. And the uncomfortable truth that his sword reveals concerns our families. Because we all know, but perhaps do not want to admit, that the difficulties and tension we daily encounter in our spiritual lives does not come from distant or unfamiliar people or religions or cultures, but instead from those who are the very dearest to us, our families. That difficulty or that tension is the division we read of in today's Gospel reading. It is the division of fathers against sons and daughters against mothers. And this division happens because of Jesus. It happens because of the truth that comes with him, the truth that outside of Christ there is no life. And he makes it painfully clear, this truth will divide. If it does not, then the truth is abandoned. And so the question for us today is, has the truth been abandoned in our lives? For how often do we neglect the truth of God with the hope of maintaining a sense of peace and unity in our families or with our closest friends? I've considered my own life. I've known many now grown children. Some of them are even my closest friends and family members, and they no longer believe what the church they were raised in teaches. And even though they no longer believe, they have a difficult time admitting it to their family and friends. For they won't leave their home church and join another church that would be more suited to what they believe. Or they won't even leave the church altogether, even though they don't believe a word of what it teaches. And why? Well, they're worried about what their mother or their grandparents would think of them. They don't want to hurt their families. But I also know that their grandparents and parents know that they don't believe, but nevertheless, they won't say anything to them. Why? Because they're just as afraid of losing them. And so in both situations, the truth is sacrificed because it is too uncomfortable to confront reality. And it's a reality that hits particularly close to home for many. Because perhaps we do have mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, or friends we even consider family, who simply do not believe. People who we, in the name of family and unity, peace, friendship and love, sacrifice the truth of God for. Now, I don't want to give the impression that families are not important. They are important. And neither is Jesus anti-family. He isn't. He created them from the beginning and honored them. They reflect the trinity of which he is with the Father and the Spirit. And they are often the most significant human relationships we will ever have. As such, we should treat them with care and respect and do everything we can to preserve and honor them. God himself expects this, for fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, children, marriages and families are esteemed and protected by no less than three of our Ten Commandments. But we have to ask ourselves today this significant question. What comes first, family or the truth of God? Because if our family gets in the way of our relationship with God, if family and the bonds of human love actually separate us from the truth of God and His Word, then this gift of God has been made into something it was never meant to be, namely an idol. An idol we love more than the God who gave these people and relationships to us in the first place as gifts. It would be wonderful if such a choice didn't have to be made. And before the fall into sin, it was a choice we never would have had to make. But it is a choice many are nevertheless confronted with. If it is not a choice you have had to make, if you've never felt the pressure to sacrifice the truth of God for your family, Consider yourself very much blessed, for indeed you are. But I'll have you still think closely. Perhaps you don't typically have all out loud and angry quarrels with members of your family concerning divine truth. Perhaps you do not have estranged relatives who are atheists or agnostics or wild pagans. But I suspect there are what I'm going to call the subtle sacrifices of truth you make in your daily life for your family. The sacrifices of truth to avoid the awkward and the uncomfortable. And because they are subtle and quiet, they're often the most dangerous. Now you know what they are. They are the excuses made for church absences. Oh, the children have sports and music and theater and what have you. But are such things more important than raising your child in the faith? Sure, our talents, our sports, music, theater, our entertainment, leisure, they're not bad. They're good gifts of God. But do you value the gifts more than the Lord who gives? 
or that the excuses when we half-heartedly attend to the worship of our Lord. Thoughts and actions such as, I'm the acolyte this week, so I don't need to come next. Or maybe I'll just sneak in for youth group, but skip church altogether. It is the summer, after all. School and college are out. Vacation is here. Jobs are relaxed. So the church schedule can be relaxed, too. Right? Or maybe you are the one who finds excuses for the pet sins that your children or your parents or your siblings indulge, but sins which you never get around to confronting. Sins concerning your family members' romantic and sexual lives. Sins concerning their lying and gossiping inclinations. Sins concerning their anger and pride. Or perhaps your whole family comes to church, sits in the same pew, or in another pew in another church, but while you're in the house of the Lord, you continue to nurse an old feud that still divides your home, or divides your church family here. Do you gladly hear and learn the word of our Lord? Do you gladly forgive as you've been forgiven? Do you search your conscience and live a life of repentance? Or do you bicker and gossip about your church and your fellow parishioners? Yes, we know these things that we do and don't do are not right. And yes, we need to be honest with ourselves and admit that we do sacrifice the truth of God. Because we know what Jesus has to say about all of this. But we ignore the awkward and the uncomfortable because it makes the day-to-day -day life easier. We think, maybe another time I'll deal with it. Or at the right time, perhaps. But another time never seems to come, does it? And it's not just our struggle. Often we like to blame the culture and the times we live in. If only we lived years ago when tr people truly feared the Lord. But search the scriptures. Many of the struggles found in those pages are between families and truth. Between so-called unity and genuine faithfulness to the teachings of our Lord. Between idolatry and true worship. For was Adam more concerned about what Eve would say to him that night if he didn't eat the fruit than he was with what God would say to him? What if Abraham had been more worried about Sarah's reaction when God told him to sacrifice their son, Isaac? What about all the things David did in the name of his purported love for Bathsheba? And we know that Solomon did put his many wives before his faith, and because of it, lost his faith and fell into despair frequently. And let's magnify it a little bit more. Since Jesus is the one talking about family divisions, what about Jesus' own family and friends? For what if Mary put her engagement to Joseph before God and his word? What about that extended family of Jesus? Besides Mary, where were the rest to be found at the death of their brother or cousin? And then the disciples. What if Peter or James or John had put the family fishing business first instead of following the call of Jesus? Yes, one could go on and on, but as you can see, it's not just us. It's not just our generation that has this struggle between faith toward God and love for each other, between family and the truth, between what binds us to each other and what ties us to our God. It's as old as life itself, it's as old as sin, and the truth is as uncomfortable as it is old. But although Jesus' words in the Gospel lesson this morning sound shocking, they're really not. Uncomfortable, yes, hard, certainly, but Jesus speaks the truth, the truth of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things, and that includes people. And so to put family first is ultimately idolatry. And if that truth hurts you, if it frustrates you, if it pangs your conscience and pierces your heart, then the truth is doing exactly what it should. For the truth of Jesus, his divine wisdom, his law, it kills. It is a sword that divides, as he said. For it divides for a purpose. It divides for repentance. For just as doctors use scalpels and cut in order to heal, so the word of God cuts in order to heal. So Jesus cuts in order to heal us. He exposes the sin to heal it with his forgiveness. He is here to make the unworthy worthy and to give you peace. Not the peace of the world, but peace with God. And to have you see that although your family relationships are important, perhaps even the greatest gift in your life, ultimately you do not find your eternal life in them, but only in Christ. For it is only in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that anything is true and lasting and good. And so that sort of Christ will divide as it has for many centuries, but it divides for a purpose. It divides for the truth, it divides for the sake of repentance, and it divides to restore and to heal and to forgive. For the Holy Spirit who works repentance in our hearts with the sword of Christ 
also heals our hearts with the truth of Christ, the truth that Jesus Christ came to forgive and to heal, the truth that the Holy Spirit is the only one who brings us to the forgiveness, the grace, and the mercy of our Heavenly Father in which He wishes to impart to us. He is the one who calls sinners to the waters of holy baptism. He is the one who calls broken hearts to the supper of the Lord. He is the one who brings back together what was apart. The Holy Spirit calls and gathers, all of which is to say that he gathers us into a new family and a new life. It is as Jesus said, Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We who have lost our lives in the waters of holy baptism have now found our lives here in this church. Here we have found a new family, a family that transcends the bounds of time and space, a family and life that will not conclude in decades, but will continue for eternity. The world will tell you that blood is thicker than water, that our family relationships create a kind of bond that cannot be broken by this world. And all that certainly sounds grand. But the trouble is that our family bonds, our human bonds, our blood bonds will end. They'll end in death. But for those of us who are gathered here today in this church, death will not be our end. For in the waters of baptism we have our beginning. And those waters give us a hope and a future that nothing on this earth can ever take away. The reality that these very waters unite us as a new and forgiven family in Christ for eternity. Time and sin may take away our earthly families, and space may separate us from close friends and relationships. But the waters of baptism do not. For baptism's waters are for young and old, rich and poor, male and female, no matter who you are, what you have done, or how great a sinner you are. Here it is that water is thicker than the blood of man. Here it is that water gathers us today, and here it is that water calls us the family of God. But although we belong to that heavenly family, we also need to remember our earthly family and friends. Because as I said to you earlier, Jesus is not anti-family. He puts us into our earthly families for a reason. We are put into families to love and to care for them. And if you are a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, a cousin, a brother, a sister, a friend, or a spouse, you know that ultimately caring and loving for people requires much. It requires much because the relationship is that very important. For we who have received the truth of God are to speak and to show that very truth to our friends and neighbors and families. Because of the gospel, we are to be who God ordains us to be, as mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and friends to the very people God has placed into our lives. It means that we can go to our unbelieving friends and family and say, I do care for you and love you, and I do believe in Jesus, and I hope that you would too. I hope this for you because, I, because the trust I have for you, the care and concern I have for you, comes from my faith. It means that a father can go to his son and not just scold him for his wayward ways, but say to him, Son, I didn't raise you to live outside the church. That is not who you are. It is important for you to be here. So come with us. We will go to church together as the family we are. It means that because you are a baptized child of God, you are a disciple. And disciples are called to pray and to be faithful. So pray for your families and friends to return to the Lord. For God is the one who converts sinners. Pray when you are frustrated with them. Pray and wait on God. Sometimes it takes a lifetime for the word of our Lord to have its way. And then remain faithful. Remain faithful to the truth that has set you free, the truth that can only set your family and friends free. There is a saying parents sometimes say when two people get married. They say, we're not losing a son, we're gaining a daughter. By faith, this is what happens in the church too. In Christ, we've not so much as lost our earthly family, as we have gained a heavenly family. We do not just have an earthly father, we now have a heavenly father, and also many earthly fathers and mothers, and grandparents, and brothers and sisters, and children and grandchildren in this very church, and all because of the mysterious working of God at that very font. That is why this font is front and center in this church. If you stand in the back of this church, you can't look at the altar and the cross without looking at it and through it. If you walk to this altar, you must go by it, just as you've gone through its waters. And as you do, remember. Remember that this water is why you are here today. For it is the water that forgives. It is the water that gives new life. It is the water that gives you a new family, a new father, a savior and a brother in Christ Jesus, your Lord. And it is the water that gives you access to this altar and this table. This altar where we pray for our earthly families, where we pray for the family of God, 
and where we are gathered at the supper of the Lord that transcends time and space. This is your life, and this is your family, and this is who you are, and thanks be to God it is so. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our knowledge, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.